Good evening. If you could know anything about a city, what would you want to know? So asks tonight's featured lecturer in a keynote anchoring our big data theme for WEP 2015, the promise of urban science. The digital age has given us an amazing ability to collect, store, and analyze data. And a natural ambition is to bring big data to bear on approving the efficiency and the comfort of urban life. Digital data doubles about every year, and about half of the world's population is crowding into cities. So the importance of getting cities right is met with this wonderful opportunity to employ new tools. Enter the Center for Urban Science and Progress, or CUSP, a great acronym, at New York University. We're sort of on a cusp right now, and we're going to hear about the program CUSP. Mike Holland is the chief of staff at CUSP, which is a graduate level program in the emerging field of urban informatics. Chartered just two and a half years ago by a consortium of academic, corporate, national lab, and regional governmental partners, the first class of 23 master's students began in September 2013. In helping to design and build this new academic program and research center, Mike oversees both the strategic planning and the day-to-day -day operations. Those of us who have been at KAUST since the beginning have a good idea of how sometimes frustrating, but ultimately how utterly fulfilling this can be when you're in a good cause. Prior to coming to NYU, Mike was the senior advisor and staff director for the Office of Science at the US Department of Energy. He helped design and execute the first ever so-called quadrennial technology review, which provides a framework for planning and evaluating DOE's energy programs. At the US President's Office of Management and Budget, or OMB, for five years, Mike was the program examiner. So he was on the other side of the DOE, uh, looking at what they were doing rather than planning what they were doing in the checks and balance system that the US has. And he also worked uh, to examine the ARPA, or the DARPA, or ARPA-E programs, the Advanced Research Projects Agency, and other units. He has re reviewed major scientific facilities such as Brookhaven's National Lab, Synchrotron Light Source, and Stanford's Linear Collider. Mike has also served as a senior policy advisor in the Office of Science and Technology Policy, or OSTP, on the staff of the House Science Committee. He is of our cloth. He did his PhD in analytical chemistry uh, from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And his undergrad degrees are in electrical engineering and chemistry from North Carolina State University. So he's well versed in Research Triangle Park. And I would like to turn the podium over to Mike Holland. Thank you. Thank you. So um, I'm going to actually describe uh, sort of what our ambitions are and how our program is designed. Uh, we're in the very early stages, so it's, I don't have a lot of results to really talk about. And again, as you heard from the introduction, I am not a data scientist by training, and I'm also not an urbanist uh, or anything like that. So um, you know, we'll uh, sort of give you the, the big picture. So. Uh, we were created as part of the Bloomberg Administration's Applied Sciences Initiative. Uh, there were four uh, awards that they made, one to Cornell Tech uh, to create, uh, or to expand the uh, engineering school uh, that was in Ithaca. They're going to do it on Roosevelt Island uh, in New York City. Uh, we were the second award. Uh, another award went to Columbia University, and the fourth award went to Carnegie Mellon in partnership with uh, Steiner Studios, which is the largest um, uh, film and TV production house on the East Coast in, in the United States. Um, and so it, it's, it's this major initiative by the city of New York to try to diversify their economy from reliance on the financial sector uh, and uh, sort of media. Uh, and so. Uh, all of these programs have this uh, flavor of trying to accomplish something that marries up engineering, uh, physical sciences, uh, social sciences, and focuses on uh, doing things that help the city in some way, shape, or form. CUSP's focus is on the actual government of the city of New York. And so uh, we are really focused on trying to figure out ways to understand the city better and make the city function. Uh, and the agencies function better. 
We are located in downtown Brooklyn, which is sort of the hot area of uh, New York City these days. Uh, and we're one of the anchors in what's called the Tech Triangle. Um, and so, sorry, the resolution isn't great, but we're sort of right, right, whoops, right down here. Uh, the, the Brooklyn Navy Yard, where Carnegie Mellon will go in, is there. And uh, uh, there's some other places over over here. Actually, the um, this is where uh, the uh, the Brooklyn uh, the Nets play uh, is, is the Barclay Center. So our focus is on big cities and big data. The um, uh, you know, the world is urbanizing and urbanizing rapidly. And so there are sort of two uh, challenges. One, for somebody who lives in a city that has been around for hundreds of years uh, and has built up uh, the, the challenges facing uh, the already established cities are uh, one set. And then for people building new cities, like the uh, economic city that's uh, just uh, around the corner here, uh, and you know many s major cities in China that are being built regularly, there's sort of a different set of problems. Our focus uh, is primarily on those existing cities. Uh, the other thing is, you know, data is uh, is coming fast and furious from all sources, and uh, so we're trying to figure out if there are uh, more useful th or useful things that we can do uh, with that that are focused on improving the public good and the delivery of services within the public sector. There are a lot of people who are f focused on uh, data analytics for commerce. Uh, in fact, at NYU, our business school has a major effort in that arena. That's not where our, our interest lies. We're uh, much more focused on how the public sector is functioning. Okay, so uh, part of our, 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 our mission is to sort of observe, analyze, model cities and uh, figure out, uh, develop these new tools and techniques that allow us to understand the city better. Uh, as noted, we are a partnership of, uh, of a group of uh, universities, uh, and there the idea is that they will s uh, we'll have uh, faculty and students that are collaborating with us. Uh, industrial partners uh, are there to provide funding, but also to provide uh, expertise in, the, in terms of senior researchers. Uh, and ultimately, uh, corporations are the, w are the entities that will commercialize whatever it is that we discover or can use. Uh, that's not what universities are sort of built for. Uh, national labs uh, uh, in the U.S., uh, we brought those in in part because many of us on the leadership team have a history with the Department of Energy, but they bring an expertise in uh, really, really interesting instrumentation that we can use to understand the city. Um, and then when we're further down the line and we're trying to uh, make sh check all of these very disparate data sets uh, and data sources for sort of internal consistency, uh, a model of the city allows you to check for that. And so uh, the supercomputing capa capabilities of the national labs will be really important for us. And then the city agencies, as well as uh, the Metropolitan Transportation Ag Authority, which is a state agency, and the Port Authority, which is an interstate agency, uh, they bring to us data, but then they bring very practical problems. The other thing is that when we actually figure out how to do something that is useful, uh, they are the ones who will then implement it in the real world. So, of course, we have all of the normal academic performance measures of graduating students, uh, faculty advancing in their careers, publications in high-impact journals. But for us, one of the major things is we actually want to have impact in the real world. And those government agencies are our route for doing that. And for us, that's our ultimate measure. Are we doing something that an agency can use? And, and so, you know, are they delivering the service more efficiently? Are they uh, targeting enforcement actions uh, with better sort of accuracy? Are they understanding that part of the city uh, that they are supposed to be delivering services to? That is our measure, ultimately. Okay, so here is our, 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 our grand and glorious ambition is to instrument a city fully. Uh, a few years ago, that sounded like an absolutely crazy thought, um, but with uh, the penetration of sensors out in the world, uh, uh, the Internet of Things is sort of the umbrella term for that, uh, that's becoming ever more likely. Now, we sort of divide the, the city into three uh, large bins. Whoops, sorry, wrong button. Uh, so uh, the infrastructure, we actually 
want to know uh, its condition and how it's being used. Uh, we want to understand the environment, the natural environment within the city. Uh, you know, is it able to provide the service, the environmental services that we need to have New York City be a healthy place? That includes clean air, uh, clean water, uh, a sink for uh, pollution uh, and pollutants, uh, and in also importantly is recreation. Is, is the environment in such a state that people actually want to use it for, uh, uh, in, in a way that um, is fun? And then uh, finally, because cities are built for people, we need to understand how people are interacting with the built environment, with the natural environment, and sort of broadly how people are interacting within the organizations within the city. We're not particularly interested in the content of anybody's communication, but the patterns of communication are very interesting to us. So what would we... What do we think we could do with this information? As I mentioned uh, you know, uh, before, one of those is provide local government a better visibility into that city in which they serve because then they can, you know, uh, they can deliver services better uh, for their citizens. Uh, we think it's an opportunity to you know, improve governance but also in improve in the engagement of the citizens with their local government. Um, there are obviously opportunities for new products and services, et cetera, that the private sector can do. And then longer term, we also think that this ability to uh, collect uh, better data on what's going on in the city can have uh, an impact on how the social sciences themselves do business. We at, at CUSP are primarily engineers and physical sciences physical scientists, and so we have to actually build that collaboration with the, with the social sciences. So we are not the first people to think of this. This is actually a very, very old idea. Uh, Aristotle uh, would stand up on, on the mount and uh, look out at, at, at Athens and, uh, and, and you know, say that we ought to uh, understand it better. Um, uh, I guess in, tr in scientific terms, one of the first times that something analogous to what we were doing uh, was done was by a guy, Holly White, um, a sociologist in the 1970s. He put uh, cameras uh, up on the tops of buildings surrounding Bryant, uh, uh, the Seagram's building, uh, and create, uh, he and his graduate students just filmed what people were doing in the plaza, and they very carefully translated all of the films into a series of graphs and started tracking residence time, how people interacted, uh, you know, did they uh, interact with the people that they came to in the park? Did they clump together in, in twos or threes? Um, you know, did they stay longer if they spoke to people? Did, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And, and the studies that he did were foundational in understanding how better to plan urban spaces, particularly in the United States. So the challenges that we face in trying to do this science um, are not inconsequential. Uh, uh, one of the criticisms that we get a lot is that, of course, this is observed data rather than designed data. Um, the gold standard in the social sciences is that you start with uh, a research question, you have a hypothesis about how people behave, you uh, design an environment or a study for to uh, query that particular interaction, and then you uh, collect enough statistics on, on that behavior. Um, that has great predictive power. Uh, it also has you know, great scientific validity, but there are a lot of opportunities, uh, we, we believe, uh, in taking an approach where you can, ob you can observe a lot of behavior, uh, you can um, start getting a much better handle on sort of the fine-grained uh, subpopulations and not necessarily focus particularly on the average behavior. Um, but there are all sorts of issues of quality, of bias in how, you, in how that data was generated, et cetera. So uh, understanding those processes are very important for uh, interpreting the data. Um, another important thing is, and particularly it, since we're interested in public sector data, um, all of the data is very carefully siloed in uh, the different agencies. And that's because that's how the data grew up. Uh, it wasn't... Uh, 
collected or generated for the convenience of scientists looking at it uh, post hoc, but you know, was designed for the purpose that the agencies had in mind. And so there are disambiguation issues. So in New York City, uh, a particular building can be referred to by five different uh, sort of ways. It's address, it's uh, latitude and longitude, building block and lot number by the tax authorities. Uh, there's a building number uh, that is used by the Department of Buildings, et cetera. And so one of the challenges that we face in trying to make this a sort of public sector data interoperable is that figuring out how to create the data catalogs that allow it to talk, uh, the, all those different agency data to talk together. Um, and so while we can't uh, do things like, you know, go off and block a, a, a road just to see how traffic flows, in a city as big as New York, there are millions and millions of interactions, billions of interactions on a regular basis. And so you can actually search around in those very large data sets and looking for natural experiments. Um, and that's uh, a, a, a very useful way to sort of get some of the science done. And of course, we always have to ask ourselves, you know, the correlation uh, versus causation uh, issue. There are many, many ways that the data can trick us when we're doing purely observational uh, 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 methods, and so we always have to be asking ourselves what's wrong with things. So another big challenge for us is privacy. Uh, many of the methods, as you'll see, that we're developing um, tend to uh, sort of w raise people's uh, uh, sort of wariness about this. There's uh, a big debate in the United States, uh, particularly about how, mu how data is being collected on people by private sector entities, by the government. And so uh, having a group like us come in and sort of try to actually collect additional data and merge it with existing data is something that um, ha people have concerns over. And, and uh, so we took that very seriously. One of our s first scholarly outputs was on, on privacy. I'll show you that in just a second. Um, the other thing is that you know, people are aware of, uh, pot potentially aware of us watching them. And so that changes the behavior. And then um, this interface between us, the engineers, and the social scientists is, is not an easy one. So as I, as I mentioned, uh, this uh, privacy and, and uh, issue is a very, very significant one for us. And before we started, the, the conversation was dominated by people worried about Facebook or Twitter or Google, uh, marketers who were collecting data on you and sort of using it to uh, predict how you were going to shop uh, or who you were. Um, uh, and then uh, Edward Snowden and the whole uh, NSA thing broke just before we got we started going, and and that again was uh, the you know dominated the national security debate, and so we were trying to refocus and and get the conversation back to understanding that there are opportunities for uh, big data and these technologies to be used in a way that actually improves. Uh, local government's ability to deliver services. Um, so if I, I won't go into this very much, but uh, about a third of the book is on sort of the legal and ethical framework for uh, U.S. privacy law. There's a piece uh, section on sort of the practicalities of how you protect data from a more computer science and IT uh, uh, perspective, and then finally sort of the statistical protections that are available. Uh, one thing to note in big data, particularly data with um, spatial information attached to it, the, the normal approaches that statistical agencies or statisticians or social scientists take for uh, uh, statistical, preventing the statistical disclosure don't work particularly well, if at all, when it comes to uh, graphical uh, um, map-like data, geospatial data. And uh, those Techniques are starting to develop, but they are very, very uh, um, untested and, and very uh, early stages. Uh, so that's one of those challenges that we have to work on. So I just want to give you sort of a tour through how we think about data and sort of what some of the techniques are that we're starting to develop, uh, give you a flavor of what we're doing. Uh, as I said, not so much uh, results yet. So uh, we tend to think of data in three broad bins. Uh, so this term, um, organic data flows, uh, was coined by a former director of the US Census, Bob Groves. 
And his, you know, he, the reason he calls it organic data flow is it's data that's generated just sort of in the normal course of doing things, whether you're a business or a government agency. It's all of the public records, you know, birth and death uh, uh, records. It's tax information, property sales, et cetera. So um, that is an area that social scientists and statisticians have been exploring for hundreds of years. Uh, the data generation um, uh, processes are well understood. The statistical limit shortcomings of those types of data are also well understood. And so, you know, we need to be uh, competent in using that data, but, you know, w we're probably not going to, like, revolutionize anything when it comes to, you know, the pure use of uh, administrative data sets. Um, sensor data is an area where... Uh, Again, my, my former tribe of people, uh, since I came out of the microelectronics-related uh, uh, areas of science and engineering, you know, uh, got really, really good. The price of microprocessors have, has plummeted, uh, storage has plummeted, and sort of every sentient engineer puts multiple microprocessors in anything that they build and then wants to uh, connect it uh, wirelessly to the Internet. And so when people talk about big data, uh, it's sensor data. Uh, that is where this this uh, actual humongous amount of data is is flowing from. Uh, administrative uh, and, and records sort of scale with the number of people uh, in the world, and whereas sensor data scales with the number of things in the world. And the number of things uh, is growing fast, and those uh, were largely uninstrumented previously and are now becoming uh, remarkably well instrumented. And then the final uh, sort of grouping of data uh, is, I think, where we at CUSP are doing something that's uh, significantly different than what your average group of people who study cities do. Like I said, we're my primarily physical scientists and engineers. We're not really your traditional uh, civil engineers, although we do have civil engineers on faculty with us. Um, uh, but... Um, you know, a sociologist or uh, a traffic engineer or an urban planner wouldn't necessarily uh, think up some of the same techniques that we would because we're uh, physical scientists inspired sort of by astronomy. Uh, so we're trying to figure out how to s take some of the ideas out of monitor astronomy and instead of uh, digital sky surveys that sweep the sky night after night after night, um, we're going to basically do the same thing, but we're going to be looking at the city night after night after night, day after day after day. Um, so, uh, so here's an idea of um, uh, you know, the administrative data. This is uh, just a very, very small slice of uh, data from a wide variety of city agencies. So uh, 311 data from uh, the police department, Department of uh, Transportation, budgetary and financial information from uh, OMB and the Department of Finance, so on and so forth. This whole data set was assembled uh, by uh, the head of the Mayor's Office of Data Analytics in the last administration with an eye towards improving the targeting of civil enforcement actions. So illegal dumping of grease by restaurants or uh, illegal building conversions that result in unsafe conditions for poor people. And so they, they were able to use this very effectively. And this is not anything wildly dramatic or innovative, but the challenge is, uh, the reason I put this up here is, all of these data sets, is, uh, you know, there are hundreds of them in any uh, government. Um, and they're very carefully siloed together, making, getting the permissions necessary to make those, that data interoperable, then going through the technical hurdles uh, for uh, making it all talk together uh, is, is its own challenge. But uh, again, a lot of the tools and techniques are s somewhat known, and the real technical challenge is for doing it sort of at scale and at speed. Um, and so there's uh, sort of core computer science work to be done in that space. But the other thing is, because we're interested in a particular uh, mission area, this idea of making cities work better, you can't do that as a pure computer science problem. 
Uh, you can't do it as a pure sort of observational problem. If you're, you know, we have, uh, our chief scientist on the Urban Observatory is an astrophysicist. Um, the problem is that all of these data, because they're about people and, it's, and they're collected because of particular powers and authorities of, of cities and states uh, and federal governments, they come with rules and regulations, and all, a lot of times those are in conflict. And so one of the things that we know we have to do is figure out how do you sort of design a data strategy that allows the, these very disparate data sources to be uh, optimally interfaced. And so if you think about what a city does for its local citizens, some piece of it is just there are basic services. They pick up the trash. They provide water. Uh, you know, they sort of set some of the, um, uh, you know, they, they build parks, etc. cetera. Um, there's another piece uh, of that uh, job that cities have of protecting the citizens and making sure that cities are a safe, maybe not orderly place to live, but it's a safe place to live, and that uh, they can respond when there are emergencies. Um, there's another piece where cities are trying to encourage activities within their boundaries, and they do that either through some combination of incentives or information. Um, and then there's another piece where uh, cities, at least in the United States, are a primary vehicle for the delivery of social services to poor families, to troubled families, to kids um, who need help, et cetera. And in, our, in, a, in the United States, there's a complicated layer of, of rules and regs and money flows between those local governments and the federal government and the state governments. Uh, and so just to give you a sense of scale, the United States uh, 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 economy is approximately $19 trillion. Uh, the U.S. government's budget uh, in the current year is about $4 trillion. And of that $4 trillion, about 16%, $640 billion of it, is transferred between the federal government in Washington and the, c and the cities and the states. And that's to help primarily uh, deliver those human services and some of the safety services uh, uh, that uh, people expect. So the other thing is when you want to make sure like how to, how to design your data system, you may want information and data moving very efficiently among the agencies that are uh, trying to deliver those services on the street. Uh, you might want information flowing very efficiently among the, uh, the, um, the security agencies. Uh, but for people, for poor people and families in trouble, uh, you know, they may not want any information about them flowing back that direction. Otherwise, they won't actually show up at the door. So again, this is one of those areas where to do this right, you can't just focus on the purely technical, statistical issues or the computer science issues. You actually have to think of that complicated overlay of policy, of funding, of authorities, and what people's perceptions are of what that, how that data represents them and their interactions with government. And that's an area that we're, we're starting on, but the, there's an enormous amount of work to be done. So I will give you uh, s sort of the, the continue, the, the, the little romp through uh, how we see data. Um, one of the areas that is a particularly good example of what we're trying to do is taxi data in New York City. Um, the, the yellow cab uh, fleet is uh, 13,000 vehicles, uh, and um, the Taxi and Limousine Commission that regulates them uh, mandated an update to the, the meter. And the meter reports to the Taxi and Limousine Commission uh, a geotagged uh, pickup and drop off along with the time of the pickup and drop off. It reports the fare, and if you, if you pay with a credit card, it reports the tip. And so uh, in New York City, that is 180 million taxi rides a year. And so that is uh, an unintentional sensor network. And so this is one of those things we at CUSP or NYU are never going to be able to fully instru instrument the city. And the way that we're going to sort of realize this ambition is to go out and find these various sensor networks, get permission to tap into them, and then figure out what, it, what those sensor networks tell you. 
Um, and so there's a lot of things that we think we can uh, do with these, but here's just two years of taxi data. And these are, these are just the actual plots of the um, about 180 million taxi rides a year. We have currently five years of data, so about 800 million taxi rides. Um, and we don't have to actually take statistical samples of things. We're developing the techniques that allow us to actually handle these entire uh, data sets as they are. But uh, the lowest number of uh, taxi rides are on a, on a, on a um, Sunday. Uh, the maximum number are on Saturday, and you see that weekly pattern. Uh, New Yorkers uh, who ride taxis go off on vacation in uh, late July and early August. You can see holidays, so um, uh, Christmas, uh, Thanksgiving right there. Uh, you can see major hurricanes, uh, Hurricane Irene, Hurricane, Hurricane Sandy, uh, et cetera. So one of the things that we uh, are interested in, again, is understanding the extent of that data generation process, so taxi cabs don't uniformly cover the city, and more importantly, they're not uniformly used by all social and, uh, social and economic st uh, stratas of New York. So you have to sort of factor, in that, factor that into the data generation process. But we can start to use these very large data sets to understand what's normal. We can look for deviations from normal. We can then drill down into particular parts of the, of the city where we have decent coverage and start understanding how uh, using these taxis to understand how the roads function. And so we can start doing things like predicting how one intersection will uh, uh, behave when you disrupt it. You know, if you're going to do, uh, uh, you're going to dig a, a new gas line or you're going to repair a broken pipe or something like that, you can design more effective reroutings of traffic uh, to give, you know, a sort of uh, a small example. Um, so we're in the process of, of, of starting to uh, collect and use this data. Uh, from a computer science perspective, uh, we're developing the tools that allow us to do uh, exploratory data analysis on those full data sets rather than uh, whatever will fit in the data, pack data analysis package that you're accustomed to using. Um, and so um, we can uh, look at, uh, you know, you can draw a region of interest, sort of uh, midtown Manhattan, and you can look at all of the taxis that are flowing to either LaGuardia Airport or Kennedy Airport, uh, and then basically instantly generate the summary statistics. And the, the advantage of this is that people are very adept at, at seeing patterns, um, and then you can use these exploratory data tools um, to figure out what you're interested in, uh, start structuring your formal statistical analyses, uh, then use these tools again to sort of confirm uh, your understanding of what that analysis tells you, and then you can start using uh, uh, folding this into your design process, uh, whether you're a, a city engineer um, or uh, uh, you know you have some other uh, interests in, in using the data set. So um, this then this third type of data, so that's the sensor data. Uh, the the third type of data is this observational data. I'll spend a little more time on this just because this is uh, somewhat unusual uh, fr uh, from. Uh, everybody, what we know everybody else is doing. And the other thing is um, there's a lot of interest in cities and data at the moment. There are a couple of other centers in the United States that are somewhat an analogous to us. Um, one is uh, the Urban CCD program at uh, the University of Chicago. They're sort of much more uh, computationally oriented, a little less uh, physically sci physical sciences oriented. Uh, and then there's another group, the Boston Area Research Initiative, that's run out of Harvard, uh, and that's uh, much more social sciences oriented uh, than we are. Um, but a lot of people are turning their attention to this, uh, this area uh, at the moment. So we're all sort of figuring it out collectively. Um, so, uh, well, the, one of the things that sort of got us uh, started on this is, is sort of just looking at this scene, which is taken from the top of the Empire State Building, uh, looking south. Um, and this was something we just uh, pulled off of, uh, off of a website. It's not a, an image that we took. And um, so uh, if, you're a, if you're a tourist or uh, 
so forth, you know, it looks like a pretty picture. Um, if you've spent a lot of time with astronomers, um, it starts to look like uh, something that uh, you could use some modern astronomical tools on. So we can do this in the visible. Uh, we can do it in the infrared. Uh, we can do it in the hyperspectral, which allows you to focus in on particular molecular vibrations of interest. In other words, you can tune your image to look at particular uh, molecules. Uh, and so the, the thing about this, this observational approach uh, that's very, very different from how people normally study the city, again, if, you're, um, if, you're, if you don't uh, find what you need in the administrative in, uh, uh, data, uh, you usually uh, then try to go out and do a survey. And surveys are very expensive, and you ha there are uh, pr increasing problems with compliance, right? you, in other words, people's willingness to cooperate with those, uh, those surveys. And so um, we um, uh, think that this is a great opportunity f uh, where you can just sort of go and look and, and observe things that would be very difficult uh, to sort of obtain uh, if you had to go and ask. And so here's a perfect example. Again, this is not an image that we took ourselves. Um, our infrared images are not quite this pretty. Uh, this is a National Geographic photographer. But you can see from the infrared that this is a building where you can see the different thermostat settings in the different apartments. Now, we won't necessarily be able to tell you what the absolute thermostat setting is on any one of those, but we can definitely tell you what the relative settings are. And if you're interested in uh, building energy efficiency and, and new energy efficiency technologies as we are, um, that would be information that would be very difficult, very expensive to collect otherwise. And so for a number of buildings, we can actually get that sort of information by just watching. The other thing that we can do um, is actually study the performance of modern building envelopes. Um, and so this is a building uh, that uh, we know, s because we can correlate uh, with uh, data sets that the city has on hand, uh, we know that that has a data center in, this in the bottom that's uh, putting out heat and also you know, the, the most of the heat is being pumped out the top of the building. Also, this is one where we, we have the potential to make problems uh, uh, visible. So this is, um, uh, this is uh, uh, what's called uh, or it's run by the uh, New York City Housing Authority. So public housing, this, these are the Alfred E. Smith houses that sit right at the base of the Brooklyn Bridge. And what you're seeing here is those buildings are run very hot. And so there's essentially one comfortable person in the whole entire building. People regulate their temperature by opening up the windows in the winter to let the heat escape. And the thing is, that's not good for the people who live there. They're not comfortable. It's not good for the environment. That's a lot of pollution. That's for, you know, uh, the electricity or the natural gas or the heating oil uh, that heats that building. If you could lower the temperature, uh, you could uh, you know, uh, reduce the pollutants. But it's also not good for the treasury. You know, that's money that you could put into something else. And the other thing is that um, in sort of modern administrative states, there is a bias towards quantitative information. If you want to go in and change how government works or how a regulation is set, you need to bring data to the table. And the thing is, poor people don't have data. And so one of the things that we think that you can start doing with big data is provide people who have not traditionally had the means to uh, make a, n a numerical case on their behalf or even something where they just have a picture where before they had nothing but their own opinions, there's, a, there's an enormous opportunity there to sort of level some of the playing fields uh, in, in, in public discourse. Um, so that's another piece. So uh, as I said, we're, we're looking at this from a number of different uh, angles, uh, both optical, uh, or, or sorry, visible, infrared, and hyperspectral. Um, so I'll, I'll pick up the pace a little and sort of show you what we're doing. So this uh, City Lights project where we're starting, this is largely technique development at this stage. Um, and so uh, we are doing nothing other than uh, watching the city. We uh, are in a perfectly positioned place in downtown Brooklyn where we have a very, very good view uh, of much of uh, Manhattan, da lower Manhattan and Brooklyn around us. And so uh, this is a nighttime picture taken and this is the Lower East Side and sort of 
uh, the uh, uh, Midtown region, so things like the Empire State Building, Times Square, uh, and oh, I forget what that building is at the moment. Um, but uh, so this is this is the project that we're in the midst of. Um, as I mentioned, we're very concerned about privacy issues, uh, so we have hired a chief uh, data officer. She had been uh, the chief privacy officer for uh, a major bank um, uh, previously before joining us. Uh, we also do things like uh, limit the resolution of the cameras that we use. Um, the other, we also sort of get the advantage of uh, this is the thing that drives astronomers crazy, is the atmosphere is, is turbulent. In our case, the atmosphere is protective. Um, the last thing I want is a uh, grad student sort of peering into, you know, somebody's bedroom. Um, and so uh, as long as we don't use adaptive optics, uh, we're safe. Um, and so uh, we also uh, work, uh, uh, try to make sure that we're using um, aggregate data and de-identified data. And so, we're, we, you know, when uh, you have to have a very good reason if you want to connect up a particular uh, image uh, with a particular address. Uh, per se. So here's, here's what it is. I mean, it, it is just uh, time-lapse uh, photographs, uh, time-lapse movies. And so uh, let this run just a bit. So one of the things you can see here, and this is what complicates our system uh, versus others. You actually see a lot of light pollution where uh, the lights in one building are illuminating another building. Uh, here we are at daybreak. Um, and so uh, we, we're starting to figure out you know, what we can do uh, at night and understand uh, how, how buildings, uh, how people are using the space. But the other thing that we can do and this is one where uh, making use of, uh, as clouds are going over buildings, we can start sort of uh, looking at ref uh, the reflectance uh, uh, of a building in the infrared with the cloud and without the cloud. We can, again, start using that to sort of calibrate the, the building envelope performance. Um, uh, we can do things when we have numbers that are this large, numbers of buildings that are this large, we can sort of do case control matches. Um, so you could imagine uh, wanting to understand uh, the impact of light pollution on, on surrounding neighbors. And so we can uh, find a building that suffers from light pollution, try to find a building with sort of similar size or socioeconomic uh, 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 and behavioral uh, uh, routines, and then sort of see what that, uh, what that uh, uh, light pollution uh, impact is. So just to give you a sense of what a, what a bit of data looks like from something like this, uh, here's one we, we actually have not connected this light curve to any particular address. So we, we don't know who it is. Um, we, in fact, don't even know whether this is residential, but uh, it allows us to tell a story. Uh, so, you know, someone, this is uh, midnight here, so there's 7 p.m. and 5 a.m. So someone comes home, turns on a light, uh, turns off a light, maybe they finish, uh, you know, turn off the lights in the kitchen, stay up until uh, 11.30, go to bed, maybe get up, you know, feed the kid or, or go to the bathroom and then go back and, uh, to bed and sleep. Um, and so it's this ability to sort of get behavioral information. And at the moment, we don't know exactly what this means or who this is or anything about it really other than what we can make these kinds of observations. Um, but uh, we did that for... Uh, 4,200 uh, windows in that previous uh, video that you saw. Um, the, uh, like I said, light pollution and the, 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 the city is a much more complicated place than looking at the galaxies. Um, and so um, we're developing the machine learning techniques that will allow a computer to pull out each of the windows uh, and not the illuminated wall next to the, uh, to the window. Um, and we're, we can start uh, creating uh, uh, these, these, these big data sets. Okay, so this is, uh, you know, one of the things that we can, one of the, sort of our central themes, again, just like with the taxi data, well, we want to be able to start understanding sort of how the city works. Uh, you know, what's the pulse of the city? And so the lights are one of those approaches. And so uh, these, uh, sorry, let me, oops, let me just go back real quick so that you guys are clear on what the data is. So uh, we're plotting in the next, uh, play, uh, chart what we call the big off. So it's the, the, tra the, the largest transition either off or on uh, 
uh, so the big off in this case uh, happens for this window at around 12.30 at night. And so this is the sort of the collection of all the big offs. These are when lights are turning on. And so you see, you know, you see repeatable patterns. Um, and then if you look at any particular set of windows on, in this case, this is Monday, and uh, this is all of those 4,200 windows sort of arrayed from the one that has its earliest off uh, to the window with the latest off. Uh, and then when you take Tuesday's data in the same order, right, you know, people, very few people go to bed or go in or out of their apartment at exactly the same time every day. But when you reorder Tuesday in Tuesday's order, you get this same uh, plot uh, again. And so we can, s we can start sort of understanding, uh, you know, how, what the variability of people's behavior is. Um, and there are some interesting applications of this for uh, where uh, the local utilities uh, are interested uh, in knowing, uh, in, in fact, um, uh, the normal way that they know that your power went out is angry people calling, um, but they also don't, therefore, know when the power goes back on. Um, and so they waste a lot of time and resources sending people out in vans and trucks to actually go and monitor visually the neighborhoods after power has been restored. And so uh, a technique like this would be of great interest uh, to the local utility. L uh, a bit less for knowing that power has gone out, but it's, it's very interesting for them about the power restoration. And then we can then, by comparison, knowing, uh, you know, how, uh, what the variability in that curve would be, we can sort of give them an estimate of uh, how much of a, pa uh, of a region has been restored. Um, so uh, that sort of gives you like that, that a practical sense of why we would be interested in this. Um, and so, again, it's this, this thing that I think differentiates us uh, or our approach to this is we're thinking about how to see the city with high coverage but also with uh, fine granularity and high persistence. We can do this night after night, day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year. Um, we, in fact, did this with an $800 camera sitting at the top of our building. Um, not very complicated, not very expensive. Um, so... Uh, and then this just gives you a, a very brief sense of sort of, you know, the vari people's variability. So in other words, most, most people, are, their behavior is plus or minus an, an hour. But the interesting thing is that we can also use this to pick out all of the lights that are on timers. So that uh, curve is not, in, in fact, centered at zero. It's actually centered at about plus one and a half minutes. Um, and so that gives you a... Uh, 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 that can be useful uh, when setting lighting standards and understanding uh, what the percentage of lights uh, on timers versus uh, under the control of people is. Uh, and then here we're trying to develop the technique to do this during the day. And I'll let you look at this for just a second. Uh, and again, it's the same area of the city. Let's see if you notice anything. Does anybody see anything? No? Okay. So what we do is, uh, again, these are relatively simple computational techniques. Um, we actually sort of just um, uh, sub subtract one frame from the next. We have a little bit of registration to do. But you can see right here whoops, uh, a plume coming out. Uh, and then uh, what we can do is then go back and color that, color code that, um, in, in, in the actual uh, original image. And um, what, what we th why we think this is useful is uh, for uh, local point sources uh, of pollution. So in New York City, one of the last remaining major pollutants, uh, pollu sources of um, uh, carbon uh, uh, particulate matter, uh, is uh, old buildings that are burning number six uh, heating oil, very heavy, uh, dirty heating oil. Um, and it's too expensive uh, to go out and instrument every last little chimney uh, in the city. And so to date, it's been hard to quantify uh, particularly well what the impacts of those emissions are. If, you know, if it's a big, uh, you know, um, you know, 
two or three megawatt power plant with a gigantic stack, it's easy to go and stick some instrumentation in that and quantify very carefully what its impacts are. But all of these little sources that are traditionally in environmental parlance an area source, in other words, all that means is uh, we don't have enough instrumentation to actually go and measure everything. Um, we think that we have, uh, we, we can use this uh, to then start measuring the outputs of uh, these smaller sources. And so we can do things like then uh, follow where that, uh, uh, where that uh, plume goes, it, which then tells you, uh, gives you information about what parts of the city are impacted by that pollution. We can also do things, again, inspired by modern astronomy, where you use a cheap camera to sort of look at the beginning of, a, of an event, and then you swing a much more expensive a camera around to then provide much greater information on, on that, uh, uh, on that uh, event. And so an $800 camera followed by uh, you know, a, a, you know, a few hundred thousand dollar hyperspectral camera then where you could then do the spectra uh, of that and do some uh, rough uh, quanti uh, quantification of the output. Uh, is something that we think is possible, and uh, we're definitely working towards that. Um, and so uh, that gives you some of those, uh, as I said, the triggered observations, uh, give you a sense of, of what we think the potential is. Uh, and then finally, one of the things that we're doing um, is working with a bunch of uh, neuroeconomists um, who study sort of human decision making. Uh, a lot of that they study in the lab, and psychologists have been uh, studying uh, how people make uh, decisions while distracted or decisions um, when, uh, you know, uh, under various incentive structures, et cetera. Um, and in New York City, one of the, ma the current mayor's top priorities is called Vision Zero. Um, uh, in New York City, about uh, 240 people are killed, pedestrians or bicyclists, are killed every year in traffic accidents. Uh, they're hit by cars. And so uh, one of the things that we think we can do with cameras that are focused on, on intersections is uh, rapidly collect an enormous amount of information about how people uh, react to uh, the level of distraction you know, are, uh, in, a, in an intersection and see if that correlates with this, uh, the level of uh, hazard uh, or, or risk of being hit uh, uh, in that city. So that was uh, the, well, this is, this is actually a, a different, it's the same intersection, but it's a different, area, uh, different uh, part of the tape. But again, all we do is take the difference of it. Um, you can see we uh, trigger on the lights when the lights change, and then you can see uh, right, the vehicle start moving right there. And then what, the, what you do is you follow that o just over time, and it's the, the measurement that we're making right here is the amount of time that it takes between when the light turns and when the vehicle starts moving. And so, again, this is a way that we can start generating uh, very, enormous, very large statistics uh, and large statistics on very particular intersections. Um, you know, we could go out and pull the data feeds from the, uh, the intersections that, based on the historical uh, uh, record, are known to be dangerous, and then we can start, uh, s you know, trying to understand uh, what it is I about either the intersection design, is that there are too many other signs, is that there's, you know, too heavy a traffic, whatever the case may be, and then um, people can start trying to then redesign those intersections uh, for improved safety. Uh, so, uh, uh, the, the rest of sort of our, our agenda, uh, you know, I sort of mentioned uh, that we have to build a, a, ca a capability for uh, handling all of this data, sort of the, you know, merging uh, and linking together uh, the administrative, the sensor, and the observational data. Uh, and so uh, we're building out a data warehouse. But the difference between our data warehouse and a standard data warehouse is that our data warehouse needs to be a machine for generating data warehouses. For each sort of research question that we're interested in, uh, we need to be able to generate another data, uh, data warehouse. Uh, I sort of described the urban observatory and, um, oops, and I, uh, 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 quantified community is sort of the converse of that. Instead of uh, you know, looking very broadly at something, we want to then uh, 
uh, sort of try to saturate a small part of the city with sensors. Uh, and then longer term agenda is uh, a modeling and simulation capability. Uh, we're, uh, we know that we can't uh, collect all of the data on our own and we may not be able to tap into all of the data from other s uh, existing sources that we might want. So uh, we'll actually need at some point um, to have uh, teach people how to collect data on our behalf and citizen science is an area that is uh, of increasing uh, spe specialization and sophistication um, for uh, uh, as its own sort of area of research interest. Um, and then uh, we, like a lot of other people, are trying to figure out uh, what the information content is of social media streams and what we can actually do with it. Um, actually, let me just skip ahead. Uh, uh, let's skip over to the quantified community. This just gives you a sort of a, a very quick uh, sense of some of the projects that we're working on. I described the city lights. Bi building informatics, we have uh, New York City is at the leading edge of uh, uh, energy usage disclosure in large buildings. Um, so we we're doing a lot of work with that. Uh, we ha have a project that we're just starting uh, in the design phase to measure the ambient urban soundscape of the city. Uh, and again, you know, privacy is a big issue. One of the things that we will not do is collect sound and video uh, from the same location. We want to make sure that uh, you can't sort of know everything about any, any particular uh, place. Um, uh, the, uh, describe some of the uh, decision-making stuff that we're working on. Um, and let me see what else is in here. Uh, oh, uh, uh, one of the things that a police department would like to do is sort of understand whether the non-emergency complaint line, 311, uh, could be used to help uh, predict what is going to be, where there are going to be emergency calls, uh, and, and if you can then sort of get people sort of uh, better prepared and ready to handle those issues. Um, a, a perfect example of something where, uh, like, uh, quality of life, like a, a, an agency that doesn't have a lot of resources and will never have a lot of resources uh, is the Parks Department. And one of the things that we would like to do is sort of give them the tools to better understand how uh, small parks in poor areas are being used. And that's something that we think uh, some of our techniques can do, uh, help do. So that's that. We, um, we uh, uh, are a, uh, a, a degree granting uh, component of the university. So we, as, as uh, David mentioned, we already had our first class uh, graduate. Uh, we have, uh, have a master's degree in applied urban informatics. Uh, we're in the process of developing a PhD program and we have some other things going on. So here is our, here is our first class that was admitted in um, the fall of uh, 2013 and graduated uh, last summer. And here's Mayor Bloomberg with us. Um, we, um, we were very proud of ourselves that we had a, a very high uh, percentage of women in our class, uh, somewhat unusual for a sort of a computationally uh, uh, statistically driven program. Uh, a major piece of the, the program is working on a very tangible product with, uh, with a customer in mind. Uh, and so these were, uh, this just gives you a flavor of some of the projects uh, that the master's students were working on. Um, and then here's our current class. We went from 23 uh, to 64, uh, and we were actually able to increase the percentage of women in our class, and uh, we also ended up with our first Fulbright uh, fellow. So let's see, uh, and I'll skip over that. So um, just to give you a sense of sort of where we are in our evolution, um, you know, we were announced in April of 2012. We spent sort of one year designing the place. Uh, we launched uh, last year, and we're in the process of, of building ourselves out. Um, and so that is our current state. And uh, in a few years, that gives you a sort of a sense of, you know, what we, what we think will be uh, in the neighborhood of, uh, you know, possibly four to 500 students be split between uh, master's degrees and, and PhDs, uh, and about uh, 50 senior researchers is a split between faculty members and researchers from industry. And so with that, uh, actually I'll skip over that. Uh, thank you and take some questions. Thank you, Mike. Uh, we feel uh, that we're an old university compared to your program. <laughs> it's an interesting, very much it's an interesting feel. 
Um, I'd like to get us started with one question. You know, you posed the question in your abstract. If you could know anything about a city, what would you want to know? And now that you've had the struggle of creating or, or imagining the kind of data sources that you need from an existing city with a lot of legacies, right. maybe not designed for data analysis. Right. If you were designing a new city, like we're doing a lot of in the Middle East or in East Asia, what right. would you advise the creators of a new city to do in order to make themselves a natural uh, customer for the kind of data products uh, that right. you can provide right. from your experience? Right. Um, I mean, maybe it's my bias from having dealt with uh, the Department of Energy for so long, but I think the thing that I would do is sort of fully instrument sort of the resource aspects of the city, um, you know, really understand and, and allow for a, a clear picture on how uh, people are uh, and organizations are using sort of those core resources, electricity, steam, water, natural gas, oil, um, because those, getting that right is core to understanding uh, the economic vitality of a city, but it's also core to understanding the vulnerability of a city to uh, uh, economic uh, impulses, uh, to natural disasters, et cetera. And so being able to sort of have very good visibility for that component of your city, I think would be probably the thing that has the most uh, immediate relevance and the, the most immediate benefit. Thank you. So do any of the uh, students or, or other audience members want to pose any questions to this uh, new you know, body right of experience, <laughs> things near and dear to us? Faustine right. can deliver the microphone. Yep. In the white. Yes, uh, so the question, uh, I have two questions. The first one, uh, on a municipal or city level, is it uh, actually possible and easy to acquire data from uh, social media? Or is it actually there's kind of restrictions? Uh, the second question, has New York City made any modifications based on the, uh, the data that uh, acquired from, from, from such, let's say, uh, centers? Mm -hmm. For example, uh, they have uh, changed the traffic directions, uh, the parking lot, I mean, uh, treat some, some of the stickers that is being actually in the city itself. Right. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so uh, the acquisition of the social media data, uh, if it's people tweeting about New York City, uh, it's for a particular agency, it's sort of relatively simple for the agencies to get that data. But uh, all of the platforms, Twitter, Foursquare, et cetera, are private companies. And while some of them have APIs, uh, they uh, pretty significantly restrict uh, the level of detail of the information that they put out. They'll put out the content, but not much else. Um, and so some of that uh, social media data can be very hard to localize. Not impossible, but very hard to localize. Um, and people are sort of not yet particularly um, confident they understand the shortcomings of that data. Like, are you really willing to, you know, redesign a program or deploy resources uh, in response to social media streams? I don't think anybody has that level of confidence yet. Uh, regarding uh, something that the city of New York has done in response to making better use of its data, not social media data, but making better use of its own data. One of those early slides that showed the data bridge with the big welter of agencies and data sets. Um, the, that was one where they actually have uh, really changed how they do building inspections. And le um, let me go into this uh, a little bit more. Um, what, they, what they do is there are 200 building inspectors for a city of 2 million buildings. <laughs> and the thing that is of most critical importance is to finding what are called illegal conversions, where someone uh, preying on poor people takes a building that should only house 20, puts up fake walls or, or uh, bad walls, and then tries to rent it to like 60 people. And buildings of that sort 
are the ones that are more prone to fire or collapse where people die. And not only do people die you know, the, that are living there, but firefighters have a much higher uh, uh, chance of dying when responding to a fire that, where there has been an illegal conversion. And so what, they, what the city did was, um, it, and this is again is where coupling the data with the legal authorities and understanding how the city works, they, they, uh, the building inspectors don't have the authority to go marching into a building. They, are, they have a civil authority. Whereas the fire marshals, if they knock on your door, you have to open it up and let them inspect the property. But the fire marshals, there, aren't, there are only, there are not even 200 of them, you know, weren't very good at taking calls from the Department of Buildings. And so what, they, what the city did was then merge um, building data, uh, emergency response data, tax data, um, and were able to start predicting whether a building was in eminent uh, state of collapse, uh, and it, it, where they could issue a vacate order. And once they, before they started doing this data analysis, 15% of the time or less, when they would send an inspector out, they would issue a vacate order, which meant for the fire inspectors, it wasn't worth their time to go on every call. After being able to pull data together, they were able to raise that uh, hit rate to 80%. Wow. Now it was worth the time that when a building inspector called, a fire marshal would go on the call, because they knew when the fire marshal went, they were likely to save the life of a colleague, right? Another firefighter. And so that, that ability to better understand how a city works, to better understand how to target your inspection and enforcement actions, and that they didn't have to collect any new data. They were just making better use of the data they already had, right? And so that's the kind of thing where we think there's enormous potential to make that crazy mess of data that, that already exists much more effective and then bring additional tools to understand how the city is functioning. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, right here. Oh, sorry. Well, actually, since you had a question right behind, so why don't we take the question? Okay. Well, sorry. <laughs> no, go ahead. Oh, eh, okay. Thanks. Uh, excellent presentation. Thank you. A lot of... Uh, useful information. I had questions, uh, several questions actually. Um, have you visited Dubai before? I have not. Um, okay. I'd be interested in your opinion about their urban planning and their, because that city has been uh, exponentially growing right, and right. Uh, they, they have done a good job, but I'm not sure how it pairs with right. your kind of uh, Yeah, so just data. quickly on that, you know, as I, as I mentioned before, sort of, you know, the challenges of a new city that's really expanding versus right. a place like New York City where change is incremental. Our focus is much more on the incremental kind of place, so I, I can't, I don't feel I can say anything with great, any authority right. on, the, on the other types of cities. Um, do you have anything uh, in your data about accidents and how that affects urban planning and intersections and changing, you know, putting lights or et cetera? Right. Um, so when I, when I talked to our transportation modeler uh, and uh, he, the, um, uh, turns out transportation modelers, in, at least in the United States, spend a lot more time thinking about interstates than they do about mm. inner city streets. Um, and a bit of that is just the bias towards better data on highways mm. than city uh, driving. And so, um, they are starting to look at that, um, but they don't, they don't have um, as particularly well instrumented as, as streets in a city as they do out on the highways. Mm -hmm. uh, your city lights, the, the uh, project that you showed, mm -hmm. um, does that affect, or have you ever thought about daylight savings? I know there was discussion in the States right. before about that right. and how effective that, that is. Right. Uh, we, we we're planning on uh, looking at uh, pre and post uh, uh, daylight savings transition in the fall, um, and uh, we had a camera failure, so we <laughs> we lost the data. 
so um, we have, yeah, we know we need to look at that, uh, but um, we're working the kinks out of a lot of systems <laughs> at the moment. Great. And one last question. Trash informatics, what is that about? Is that uh, like intelligent trash bins reporting when they're full or stuff, things like that in other countries? Uh, so trash informatics, it, tur it turns out uh, the, the entire, like many urban systems are designed for invisibility. Um, and, you know, you put something in a trash can and you see a janitor take it away and that's probably the last you actually see of your trash. Um, and so uh, one of the things that we're trying to figure out, uh, particularly uh, for New York City, which uh, ha needs to have a much higher... Uh, recycling rate, but m not just that the amount of material is recycled, but we need to do a better job of sorting things. Um, you know, right now we sort on glass, metal, paper. What we really ought to sort on is clean and dry versus wet and dirty. Um, because if it's clean and dry, whether it's glass or paper or whatever mixed together, if it's clean and dry, there are a lot of, there are a lot of very good engineered solutions for doing that separation. And the thing that we don't really understand particularly well is what are the factors that affect that behavioral decision of do I put it in the trash do, or do I separate it correctly or do I separate it incorrectly? And so w there are enormous opportunities for studying that decision making and there's a lot of stuff that we can do instrumenting trash cans, right? And uh, so we're starting to think about that. And we actually have a graduate student that that's he, who's just started on that area. And his thesis will be trash. His thesis will be trash. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Right, I saw uh, one another, other question, another question in the back. We'll, yeah. Uh, me too, I'd like to thank you about this very interesting talk. And I also have to confess that I didn't understand 100% of it. So please excuse Sorry. me if this question is already explained. But uh, I kind of have the impression that you talk more about to identify the problem or more like do some general analysis. Do you think uh, it is uh, your job to come up with an uh, actual solution to it? So for example, for this uh, light, light pollution project, right. Say if you have identified, say in this building, uh, are using unnecessary energies. So what could be a potential solution to that, or is uh, you, you'd like to leave to the politician to decide about that? Right. So um, I think the areas where we will go further down the solution chain I are those where uh, uh, a policy can be changed. So in the case of light pollution on surrounding buildings. Uh, there are a number of policies that once you have good data, uh, you can influence. Uh, so that can be on uh, the permitting by the Department of Buildings on the size of the light, uh, of, of, of a sign, or the brightness, or the hours of operation are also something that is permitted. So if we can demonstrate a differentially adverse impact, uh, the city can then basically tell the s owner of the sign, well, you have to turn off uh, your signage at, say, uh, 11 p.m. rather than leaving it on until 1 a.m. Um, so that is an example of, I think, where we can do something. Uh, anything where uh, there's essentially like a software switch. Uh, so um, we could do something, say, um, uh, changing the timing of street lights. If, there's, uh, if we learn something that would allow us uh, to argue that uh, you know, a longer yellow light or a, 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 a longer cycle between lights or whatever would improve the safety, that's something that essentially, you know, it's programmable, right? That's the kind of stuff where we think we can have a, a, a rapid impact and it's easier to do. I think the thing where we would have a much more difficult time having impact are anything where it comes to um, major changes in the built environment because of the costs involved, particularly if those costs are uh, borne by the private sector, I think are, uh, that, that's one where uh, it would be much longer term and our information uh, input would be uh, weighed very significantly against other political considerations. 
Oh, okay. So do you evaluate, uh, say, if these solutions are feasible before you carry out this uh, project? Or because, I mean, if you s ask the politicians and they say, no, we don't want to do that, then your effort is just wasted, yeah. Well, so, um, so I worked in the federal government long enough uh, that I know uh, that when you go in and you ask that question, uh, oftentimes the answer is no. Um, and so that's not uh, reason enough not to charge ahead. I think, you know, the thing that we, uh, we want to be able to do good science, uh, right? That's sort of our first criteria. Um, but the other thing is it, it's important to understand that as you are doing the study or you're, you're doing the project, it's important to be communicating with the agencies that have the potential to do something. And their first response may be no, as they understand more what you're doing, why you're doing it, what the potential uses are. And oftentimes, they will think of additional usage, uses. We've actually had that, uh, where you, know, you go in and the agency is you know, not so sure about it. As they think about it more, they become more interested. Then they sort of say, well, you know, if you could do this versus that. You know, and that's the kind of interaction that you want to have. So I, uh, we don't presume that the first reaction is the long-term reaction. And, and again, whenever you're working with government agencies, uh, you, know, you, should, you should always sort of go back multiple times. OK, so, you, so it's yeah. like you do evaluate uh, saying, if I do this project, I could potentially identify this problem. And Correct. the potential solution could be this, this and which is feasible. Well, yeah. So, so we we are uh, we don't necessarily we don't think up all of these things sort of in isolation, right? We are having a regular conversation with city agencies as to what their interests are, what their needs are, uh, and so forth. So it, it's a, it's a give and take. Okay, thank you. I think one of the uh, most That's fascinating. Uh, okay, we'll we'll take one more if it's okay. a brief one, not an essay. <laughs> Hello. Uh, th thank thank you very much, Adam. I just had a question about. Um, how do you, how can you make sure that the big data doesn't lead you astray, you become overconfident in what you see, you think the lights twinkling a certain way means something and then you try to, um, you know, by policy push it toward a certain thing right. without, just because that data is easy to get but the other data isn't. Or for example, that policymakers think they're well informed but they may not have considered, let's say, roundabouts because there's Correct. no data on that. Right. Right. Uh, and you're, you're perfectly uh, you know, right to sort of raise that question. In fact, uh, New York City is the exemplar of where things have gone wrong previously. There's a famous example of uh, Rand doing a study in the late 60s on uh, sort of the resource allocation of fire departments. Uh, and they recommended closing a bunch of them. And it turns out, for a wide variety of reasons, uh, they didn't think through that recommendation carefully, and it was ex accepted, and it led to a lot of problems with uh, not being able to put out fires in the Bronx. So the answer to your question is uh, regular engagement with both agencies, but also with domain specialists. So you know, if we think of ourselves as sort of like you know the big data science discipline, right? Engaging with people who know something about, whether it's the transportation system or the building infrastructure, you know, the built environment uh, of the city, et cetera. Um, you know, you don't just do this sort of hermetically sealed away. Uh, and to be quite honest, the, that engagement is not always natural uh, for uh, researchers. Uh, you know, they want to be the experts in whatever it is they're doing. Um, and having to go over and sort of be told you're barking up the wrong tree or you're, you know, you've constructed your analysis incorrectly is not you know, the warm response that they're looking for. So you know, a piece of this is developing that culture at cusp of sort of knowing what we know but also trying to make sure we know what we don't know and talk to people who do know things where we don't. Um, and so uh, that we are trying to do very consciously. You know, we'll find out in a few years if we were any good at it. But you know, that's, I, I think that's how you have to tackle that problem. Uh, thank you very much. So one of, I think, the most fascinating things of your 
talk is just to enumerate the number of dimensions of, of really fascinating inquiry that are possible here. And who would have thought that there would be a strong link in astrophysics between tonight's talk and last night's talk. <laughs> but indeed, you know, that's such a different perspective from a social right. scientist right. and uh, so forth. Right. So that's really, it's really rich. Um, for those who are interested in big data uh, and cities, uh, there'll be a BBC documentary starting in about 20 minutes over in the Discovery Square Theater on the promise of big data. Uh, a couple of other things to mention. Tomorrow night, same time, same venue, we're going to have MIT mechanical engineering professor Annette Peko Hosoy speaking on what we can learn from animals like clams and snails and so forth in designing effective robots. So how, what, what mes lessons from nature can we, can we bring over into the uh, you know, human design realm for, for energy efficiency and functionality? Uh, if you liked last night's lecture, tomorrow at 12.30, Anthony Reedhead will give a second lecture on cosmology, in this case on what we've learned recently about black holes. And there'll also be a mini planetarium set up outside the student center that will be operational between noon and 5 p.m. Uh, tomorrow. And I think that concludes all the uh, announcements. So I just want to present our speaker with uh, a WEP gift bag, which includes our famous GPS <laughs> system, the uh, Arabian Astrolabe. Great. Maybe you can find a use for it in urban science. Okay. Well, thank you. Th thank you very thank much, you. Mark.